Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Music Masterclass. My name is Mark Sabatella, the director of the Mastering MuseScore School, and this is my weekly live stream I do on Thursdays where we uh, look at making music, what's involved in creating it, how to create better music. That's what we do. And uh, I'll talk about some of the things on my mind, and we'll take a look at some of your music and uh, see, uh, see how we can all learn together. So uh, strap in and uh, we'll get started. All right, good to see everyone checking in in the chat. And I need to do my sound check here because I'm still not going. Am I still not going, really? It says I'm going here. It says I'm in the Music Masterclass. Oh, there I am. Okay, good. Sorry, it's a longer delay than usual. Huh. I don't know if you even heard the uh, introduction there, but uh, no matter if you didn't. Uh, for some reason, it sh didn't show up on my phone. Um, but it's just the standard thing. I play some music and I say who I am, right? You all know that. So, um, so yeah, one of the things uh, that I've been talking about lately is I'm talking about the subject of form. And I knew I had wanted to lead to... Um, lead into that subject. I kind of realized that last month that I want to talk about the subject of form. And specifically, I'm going to talk about sonata form coming up. And we're going to, that's going to be like the, the challenge that I'll have for the next month or so of, let's try to write a sonata. I realize I've never written one. I've never written a sonata. I've never even written a sonata movement. And so uh, I'm going to do that. And I hope you, you all uh, take me up on this also. So <laughs> let's take a look at what's actually involved in doing that. Now, last week, <clears throat> I mentioned, uh, seemed like just maybe an offhand comment, but it was uh, a little more um, planned than that, that um, uh, that you could look at Beethoven's Fifth Symphony and talk about the form of that and how much, you know, where he's reusing bits of melodies. And I see at least one person has actually posted uh, their analysis there. I haven't actually uh, had a moment to look at this. Things are still just really crazy over here. I got to find my right window. Is it this uh, window that I'm on? No. Okay. Somewhere. It's this one. Okay. So um, uh, uh, this is Dean Hamill that has gone through and labeled themes. You can see he's got an A theme marked here and then a B theme marked here. And he's kind of marking things up in that way. And then here's a return of A. Here's a, a C. And so just off um, kind of uh, the top of my head, what I can see is that he's looking really kind of... Uh, microscopically at this is maybe how I would describe it in that this theme ba -da -da -dum, is three eighth notes followed by a half note. And so is this theme, ba -da -da -dum, right? That's also three eighth notes followed by a half note, but the um, pitch levels are different, right? Because the original one was three of the same pitch and then down a third. Uh, and the modified version is kind of stepping down. And then there's what he's calling B prime, an inversion of it where it goes up. Um, so uh, at one level, yes, those are independent themes, but at another level, it's sort of an expression of the same motif just with some pitches changed, right? And I'm not saying one's a right way of looking at it and the other's wrong, but it's good to be able to look at it at multiple levels, to look at it both at that zoomed in level where you can see how this phrase da 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 dum is different than ba da da dum, which is what I see here, except that's not a C. Let's find out what a C is. Um, uh, da -da -da -dum, there's a C, okay. I'm gonna have my pitch reference set for the day. Let's come back over to MuseScore and uh, make sure I, I'm in agreement with, there we go, C. Okay, so at one level, you want to look at things kind of that microscopic level, but then at, at another um, bigger picture level, this is all part of the A theme. Um, it's all different variations of it. The next really different theme doesn't really show up, and he's got another version marked as C, where it's three pitches in a row, then down a step, right? That is indeed a different shape. But these are all, I would call them A1, A2, A3, or, you know, different sub-motifs within the A theme. But the first place where we really get someone um, 
a, a, a really uniquely different melody is here. That's the transition, this. Right, that is the second really independent theme, right? That doesn't seem like it has anything to do with the original theme, except in Beethoven's case here, he actually right so he's got in the low string so he's reusing the motif from the first theme in the second theme so what i'm going to want to talk about is right uh sometimes i'm interested in talking about these uh the microscopic level um where you're looking at uh the fact that this motif b is different than this b prime motif because one's going up and one's going down but um I'm, I'm also just uh, want to flip back over here and make sure I didn't miss something um, in chat or anything because I really I haven't looked at it. So yeah, concertos are totally in sonata form also, and so you you can do this however you want. I'm gonna I'm gonna <laughs> step back after I uh, talk about this a little bit more and talk about you know what I really mean by sonata form because um, not everyone will know what that means or why it would apply to a concerto as well as a symphony. So anyhow, it, it, sometimes I'm interested in talking about these little detail levels that this is a descending phrase and this is an ascending phrase. Uh, that is what we call inversion. And those of you, well, those of you who follow me on MuseScore.com or are checking out the progress of my counterpoint course, you have probably seen that uh, I have been busy posting handouts. And let me actually jump over to uh, ones that I just posted. So just in the last few days, I posted these various handouts um, having to do with how we develop a melody. The idea that you can take a melody and then take that same melody upside down. So every ascending interval became a descending interval and vice versa. That's called inversion when you do that. And that's what's happening here between ba da da dum ba bum 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 right? So ba da da dum in the violin ones, then ba 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 bum in violin two. So that's an inversion. One of them's going descending, one of them's ascending, but with the same uh, the same shapes, the same intervals otherwise. So um, I am uh, keep looking. Uh, Four movement concerto? No such thing of a four movement concerto? Uh, really? I would bet that uh, that they're actually pretty common. Um, I would get. The, I, I would assume that they're fairly common, but I guess I don't really know that for a fact. Um, anyhow. Um, so what we are going to be talking about is not this microscopic level, but that bigger picture level in which it basically took him all the way through uh, that horn line that I played to finish stating his A theme. So his A theme took, uh, you know, almost 60 measures, it looks like, to state fully, even though it was made up really of just a couple small cells. But when we get to this next melody, it's really a totally different melody here. That melody doesn't relate to the ba 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 bum theme, right? It's a new melody. So when I talk about a theme, a symphony, or sonata form in general being based on two melodies, which I haven't necessarily said before, but that's what I'm going to tell you right now. Sonata form is based on two melodies. You have your one melody and your second melody that are contrasting in some way, usually in different keys. Um, so you have these two melodies, and yes, within each one of them, you can look at how the motifs relate to each other, but there's going to be these two main themes. So when I talk about sonata form, we use the word sonata form, I don't know, historically that's what they came up with, but it applies to a number of things. It applies to actual sonatas. It also applies to most symphonies. It also applies to most concertos or concerti, to say it more uh, properly in, uh, in Italian. And the thing is, even then, that's only looking at one movement, right? A sonata or a symphony or a concerto usually has multiple movements, at least two movements, more often three, and in the case of symphonies, often four, uh, five is not unheard of, right? You can have multiple movements, and the movements are generally totally separate. And this is something that is, um, when I say they're totally separate, I mean the themes of one movement 
rarely reappear in another movement. Maybe there's like some little side glance reference to, uh, you know, one movement might sort of hearken to a theme from another movement, but there's rarely direct connections. It's more, I mean, think about this. These forms came about long before there were LPs or anything, right? But this is basically an LP. If you think about a concept album where the songs aren't just random songs thrown together, but someone decides I'm going to put out an album and I have all these related songs and they're going to be in this particular order and you're going to flip the LP at this point, right? That's your intermission. Um, a sonata or a symphony or a concerto has kind of that same thing. You've got these separate movements that are related to each other, but mostly they're related to each other at some concept level, but realistically they're independent songs. So the first movement, as is being uh, mentioned here, it's the first movement of the sonata that's one or symphony or concerto that's typically in what we call sonata form and i see that yeah there's discussion of that here and so uh mr firefox is saying uh exactly accurately that there's three um kind of sections to that and that's what i i think that's a good way of looking at it sections the first section is what's called the exposition and that's where we see those first two melodies so the exposition of this symphony is we're not done yet. We're only in the second theme. And there's all that stuff and it goes on for a little while. And when that section finishes, in Beethoven's case, he actually kind of reintroduces some stuff from the first theme. Get into it. Right, those last few measures was basically restating material from the A theme at the conclusion of the B theme. And that's uh, not unheard of. Um, and then it repeats, right? The whole a the whole exposition that big old a theme that big old b theme and whatever connecting material there is, exists between it repeats that's what happens in the exposition of a sonata also typically i said they're often in contrasting keys if your main theme of a sonata form piece is in a minor key then the secondary theme is often in the relative major not always but often um or uh, for major key pieces it's typical that the secondary, the B theme, would be in the key of the five. So if your A theme was in C, your B theme would be in G. And I'll show you an example of that, a real familiar one uh, to a lot of people in a moment. Um, and one of the reasons why that's the case is it's if you're going to repeat, that's the easiest way to get back to the original key is to keep them related in that way. If you've just finished a theme and then repeated it, where did my repeat sign go? Um, when you hit the end of that section here, we're in E flat major, and then it's the same pitches that we get to hear because relative major, relative minor are going to share all these notes in their tonic chords. That E flat and G, the first few notes there was G, 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 E flat. And that was the last notes of the major key theme. But now it can be the first notes of the minor key theme because that's part of a C minor chord also. So um, that's one reason why that's a typical arrangement. And in the case of a major key um, piece, and this, this happens in minor keys also, where you modulate to the five, it means if you're in C and then the secondary theme ends in G, it's really easy for that to get back to the beginning because that G naturally wants to lead the C. We might finish the A section hearing that G as, as the one chord in the key of G, but then when we start with the repeat, uh, we, uh, we then kind of rehear the same thing as the five chord. So I'm going to show you this really famous Mozart piano sonata. So here's the, the melody here.
So that is the A theme of this particular sonata. And then we have our B theme. So if you look at the A theme, it's pretty clearly in the key of C. All right, that's a one chord, a five chord, back to one. Let me reset my volume here. I know that's quiet. Um, but when we hit the B theme, it's clearly in the key of G. We have a one chord, five chord, and back to the one chord. Notice there's not a key signature change. We typically don't bother. We typically just, because it's gonna be a related key, it's gonna at most have one accidental um, that you need. I see also discussion about the extent to which movements can be related. And yeah, yeah, you def, def, typically make, as I said, little sidelong glances at the other movement where you reuse some tiny little motif, but you typically don't reuse the entire theme from movement to movement. That is extremely rare. But yeah, there might be a little three note motif that ba 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 bomb might show up somewhere. Maybe not the entire melody based on that. It might show up in a totally different context, but there's often these little subtle references. So uh, this secondary theme here is in the key of G. So at that point, we have just concluded in the key of G. We are very happily in the key of G. But I'm going to play those last four bars, then let it take the repeat. So we ended in G, but we start right off again on the repeat in C, and that works specifically because we did end in that relative, uh, not relative uh, major, we ended in the five chord. We ended in the key of G. So that secondary theme, by putting it in G, means that when you take the repeat, which is typical in all these sonata form pieces, you can, uh, it just connects very nicely. This G felt like the one chord, one, Five one, five one. But then our ear can rehear that one as if it was the five in the key of C, and it goes to C. So we can hear that same chord as the one in the old key, as well as the five in the new key. It's the most natural way to make a transition like that happen. Other than I said, relative major and relative minor will share notes also. So those are kind of the two different ways you could establish these themes. And typically, they are uh, kind of like what Beethoven's example was. Oh, this is a different Beethoven example, where the original theme is ba 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 bum, you know, this dramatic thing, and the others da 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 da, da this really pretty thing, right? That's pretty typical that the first theme is an intricate one, a big one, and a complicated one, and the second one is the pretty uh, theme within the movement. And then maybe a second movement or third movement of the symphony or sonata might be the pretty movement where the whole thing is uh, kind of that type of vibe. So that is the exposition. So we, we just heard the, the, the full exposition of that Mozart piece because it's pretty short. But after, let me turn off the repeat now, after the exposition is going to come what we call the development. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step back and talk about the big picture in one moment. Now comes development. And in this case, he started the development by just going from G major to G minor. You can do anything you want in the development. So at, at the big picture level, I said we have the... Uh, um, exposition where you state these two main themes and then repeat them. And then we have the development section where you say, hey, I've got the, all this, all these motifs that I presented in the exposition. I'm going to play with them. I'm just going to have fun. And then after that comes the recapitulation, which is basically just go back to the beginning and redo the exposition. Except typically when you redo the exposition, we don't 
we, we, we juggle stuff around so that the two themes are not in separate keys because we're not going to do that whole repeating business. We want it to end in the same key we started in. So if you have your A theme and your B theme, at the end of that B theme, we want to be back in the original key so the whole movement ends in the same key it started. Now, you could just put a little modulation at the end, but most composers choose to put the entire B theme in the original key. So in fact, let's uh, just skip over and hear that. Um, we already saw that in the Mozart, we have C major. And that by the time we reach the B theme, we're in G, right? Well, when the recapitulation happens, here's the uh, recapitulation. Um, you know, I'm looking at this and realizing uh, he, he cheated this and actually put his, I, did I, I I've, I've never really even thought about that. Some of you who know this piece, um, better than me, uh, have been like snickering at me probably for the last five minutes as I've been talking about this, because he does this pretty unusual thing where he actually puts the A theme in, in F in the four chord. So he doesn't have to change his modulation. He can still go from F to to C, which is from, you know, if F is our one chord, C is our five. So coming out of this, he'll be in C, which is where he wants to be to end the piece. Now here we come into C, C major. So he gets to have his B theme in C. And yes, I see it being mentioned that some concertos, some symphonies don't bother repeating. This is true, and sometimes even when it's notated in the interest of time on a concert program, the repeat isn't always taken. And you have to remember all these forms, they're, you know, you take them with a grain of salt. This is a basic form that people follow, but then you, imp you include your own uh, variations on these ideas. So you're always, uh, you're uh, welcome to. So um, so Mr. Firefox is saying that he does this thing of starting on starting in the key of the four, the subdominant. Uh, yeah, that is definitely a thing because Beethoven is freer in his use of keys than a lot of other people. Uh, Mozart typically is a little more by the book as far as this goes. But like the very first Beethoven sonata that I, of any consequence that I played was the Pathétique, actually the only one that I've really played all of, all of. And the first movement of that goes from C minor to really E flat minor. So it's as if he was going to the E flat major and goes, no, I'm not in a happy mood today. Yeah, I'm gonna give you the E flat, but it's gonna be E flat minor. <laughs> so that's what he does with that one. And that's not, not a common thing, but that's Beethoven. So, um, so this idea that you have your exposition where you state these two themes, and then you have your development section, which we're gonna look at next, but then we have this recapitulation where you restate the same two themes pretty much note for note other than you juggle the keys around so that they so it ends in the same key it started. Literally, the recapitulation is copy and pasted from the A section um, or from the, uh, the exposition. The development section is kind of do whatever you want with, the, with these motifs. And this is when you take the microscopic view and say, he's got a melody that goes ba do da dum And he's got another one that goes ba do da dum And he's got one that goes ba da 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 And he's got another one that goes ba da 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 And he's got another one that's all these little arpeggios. ba ba da ba dum ba ba da ba da ba da Right, all those things. And now he's going to take all of those motifs and throw them in a blender and see what he gets. That's basically this ending motif, but just made minor, right? So here it is. That little phrase there, you could say is probably related to this. Right? It's related to that. So he's taking ideas that he's already told you about and saying, now what else can I do with that idea? And that's what you do in a development section. 
And that is now we're in D minor. Another hallmark of the development section is they don't stay in one key very long. They tend to move between keys, usually between related keys. And by related keys, I mean only one accidental different. Um, so if you're in G minor, the key of G minor has two flats. And notice again, we're not talking about key signatures. It's, this is all done through accidentals. You've got two flats. So the related keys to a key with two flats, actually here's the official jazz way of notating two flats. You hold two fingers and point them down. That's how we talk about the key of two flats in the jazz world. Um, so that's G minor or B flat major. So uh, two flats, a key with only one flat like D minor or F major is related or a key with three flats like E flat major or C minor are related as is uh, the other key with two flats, B flat major. Um, and then as a special sort of special di dispensation, what we call the parallel key. So if you're in G minor, go to G major, and that is also considered related for this purpose. So let me just actually play through the entire development. It's pretty short. And now we're back to the uh, now we're back to the recapitulation. So I saw a question uh, that in the usual case there, where you have oh wait a minute, if in the case of a minor A moving to a major five B theme, how does the the recap the recapitulation state? That's a good question. Find me an example of that. I said it happens. Right? I said sometimes you might do that, but maybe you go to the minor five, not the major five, or maybe you let that major become minor, or maybe you just because typically a minor key, a minor key piece, at least in the early, in broken early classical, they would end with a Picardy third, right? So you could just choose to just do that. Don't bother to end in a minor. Just let that last theme be the major. Um, so you would go from C minor to C major for that second theme and just let it be done. Um, but yeah, I'm sure you could do an analysis of the literature and see what's typical. Um, I don't have what you would call an encyclopedic knowledge of the literature to be able to point to all these different examples of which one does what with the keys. I, I have a good knowledge of the theory and the general ideas and a few examples here and there that I can point to. So uh, someone else might want to do a, a more thorough examination of the literature. But so let's talk about the, the related keys here. G minor, And now at this point, you see that C sharp showing up. That's how you know we're modulating. And now we're in D minor, right? And we're going to have that same little passage in D minor. And now we're going to have that little scale thing happening in D minor. And now we have a G sharp showing up. That's our clue now that this is going to be moving to A minor. And, and now we have what's well, basically a big circle of fifths progression. It's gonna go very quickly. It's not gonna stay in the key of A minor, but we've reached an A minor chord, but now we're gonna follow the circle of fifths. A, D, G, C, and then, okay, then it leaves the circle. But at that point, he's moved from A minor to D minor to G7 to C. That's six, two, five, one in C major. And then back to the A minor again, and back to E, and back to A minor. But from the A minor, at this point, instead of going from the A minor continuing his circle to D minor, he takes that A minor and goes to a B flat chord, to C7, to F. How does he get from A minor to, to B flat? Well, if, you're, if you think of that A minor as being the three chord in F, then now you can say, oh, well, I can move to the four chord. So this is a common thing of modulations. You have a chord that functions as one thing in one key. And then you just say, well, now let me reimagine that chord. So that A minor was the one chord in A minor or the six chord in C, but I'm going to now think of it as the three chord in F. And then I can go from there to the four chord. It's called a common chord modulation. You have a chord like A minor that has one function in the previous key and a different function in the new key. And that kind of 
help set up this like overlap. Um, so he's B flat to C to F, and now we're in F, and we can finish out our modulation. So, um, okay, I'm reading over the comments about the keys, and I, I like that there's some good comments about that. So thank you for addressing it with specific examples. It's always good to have someone who knows the specifics here. So I'm going to talk more about big picture-y sort of things here now. We had a exposition that states themes, and there was kind of an A and a B within it. Then we have a development section that plays around with some of that material. And then we have our recapitulation that has that same A and B theme. I am looking at it in those big pictures to point out that that big picture is huge, not just in a classical sonata or symphony or concerto. This is how virtually every single jazz performance that you've ever heard or played, if you're a jazz musician, is structured. You have a lead sheet. And you play that melody down, and it's usually a 32-bar melody with an A theme and a B theme. They're usually A, A, B, A, 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 A theme repeated, then a B, and then a return to the A. So the B theme is in a separate key. Usually it's like in the key of C. It might go C, C, and then the bridge there, the B, might be in the key of E or E flat or A minor or G or F or some other key. And then we return to the original key for that final A section. And if... And typically, we don't repeat the entire uh, head, we call it, instead of exposition. Um, we don't repeat that entire 32-bar form because we've heard enough of that A section by now, and now we're ready to start improvising. So if, if you have that A sec, if you have that head there, A, A, B, A, that's like, the, that's like the exposition of a sonata. Then we have these improvised solos. That's like our development section where you take ideas from the exposition and play with them. In a classical sonata form, the ideas you're playing with are typically melodic ideas, that you're taking the original melodic ideas and uh, spinning them in different harmonic ways. In a jazz setting, it's the other way around. You take the original harmonies from the exposition or head, um, but you make new melodies over them. Again, I'm talking general cliches. There's lots of different ways you could structure jazz, but man, a whole lot of it is exactly what I said. Head, solos, and then head again. And so the term recapitulation, that cap in there, I think is the same Latin root as head. So I think there, I think that's why we call it a head in, uh, in jazz, because I think we're referencing the word recapitulation, but I could actually be just inventing that. That could be not true at all, for all I know. So um, that idea that you have, you stay something, then you play with it, and then you state the original thing again. And because the, the theme is usually A, A, B, A like that, there's no need to fiddle with the keys because we are already returning to A. Other themes go A, B, A, B, and the B doesn't modulate in those cases, or it doesn't modulate much, and it, it still manages to end in the original key. So we don't need to change the, uh, the recapitulation or the head out. We'll talk about the head in. Am I going left to right for you guys, or am I going right to left? I don't know. Uh, but uh, the head in, where you first play the melody, then the solos, then the head out. The head out can be literally exactly the same, and usually is, as the head in. We don't need to fiddle with the keys to get it to work. Um, so uh, I, I love it, uh, Mr. Firefox, that you are commenting about this and putting in specific examples, because it's giving people good things to look up. And sorry if I don't have time to engage with every single one of them here, but I love that these examples are here. So um, so I guess, uh, Joanne, one of the question is, um, uh, if you ever actually got um, your piece Set up because the last I checked, we still couldn't see your piece, right? Um, but let's find that out and let's just see. I'm going to go over to uh, the community and come to the share and discuss space and let's see if you've successfully gotten that thing happening yet. Final try. Oh, this is okay. And I did not see this final try version, but it's looking promising. Ha! Ah! Made unavailable. So yeah, unfortunately, it's still not showing up, and I don't know uh, exactly why. Um, and and I have to say, I have not been able to engage as much lately because I I've, I've told you I'm in Florida. I'm with my family, and uh, my father has been in and out of the hospital between 
hospital and rehab. And uh, so it's just been a lot of family stuff going on. So unfortunately, I haven't had as much time for engaging uh, with uh, things here as I would have liked. Um, so yeah, hopefully, well, this one says it's a secret link. Uh, let's see if this one, if you manage to get this one going. Oh my gosh, there it is. Yay. You have one working. Fantastic. Ah, love it. I'm going to download it right now if I can. If you didn't, there's a box you can check to turn off download and hopefully you didn't do that. Ah, ah I'm so happy. So happy we're finally going to get to check this out. So I will listen to it and we'll get to check it out more next time. But I want to talk about the why forms exist and why any of this matters and whether it matters actually, because that's a, 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 an actually very good open question, I would say, does it matter if you follow these forms or not? So, um, oh, fantastic. All right, so it's very common that key pieces will modulate throughout their, uh, the course there. And this idea that we want to modulate to what I called related keys, in the Baroque era, first of all, pre-Baroque, they didn't think in terms of keys at all. That's sort of a Baroque or late Renaissance, early Baroque invention. But from the time of the uh, the Baroque through, say, Chopin-ish, you know, so a couple hundred years, modulations were almost exclusively to related keys. What you have here is a modulation I can see from F and now we're still in F, but we have a B flat chord and then a five chord, a C chord back to the B flat chord and now a C chord and then you have a very a very sudden modulation to uh, apparently A flat. There's a D flat chord there, but I'm assuming that's just a four chord. So this really sudden modulation from F to A flat, that would not be a thing in the Baroque or early classical periods. By the time maybe, you know, we're talking late Beethoven, yeah, it becomes more of a thing. And certainly once we get to Schumann uh, and Chopin, these fairly abrupt unrelated modulations, unrelated keys, distant keys from F to A flat become more common. Now, if this four flats had actually been F minor, now it's something that, you know, Haydn would have been okay with. Going from F major to F minor, Haydn would have been okay with. Going from F major to A flat directly, not as much. So, um, yeah, no, Joanne, you're, you're definitely good now. So we have, we have, uh, um, we uh, now have uh, your score, so yeah, you, you don't have to keep fiddling. So that going into the uh, the key of A flat for a little while, and actually you never even hit the A flat chord, right? I see you have a five chord, a four chord, and then a five chord from e, D flat to E flat, then back to D flat, and then and then you just come right to F. Let me just hear that. Okay, at that point, you're back to F. So what I would say is you probably didn't need to put the key change in there. It didn't last long enough to actually be worth uh, notating the modulation. You can if you want. And certainly, like, I know I, I did an arrangement of Rhapsody in Blue that some of you may have seen for string quartet and piano. And I, so I studied the original scores, like the, or, the the two different orchestra score versions, as well as the solo piano and the piano duet arrangements that are, you know, sort of official arrangements. Um, and some of, and they typically notated those key changes. There's like, you know, that would only last for a few measures that I think most people today would not bother doing. Um, and so this is one that I probably wouldn't do, but Gershwin probably would have. So, you know, uh, <laughs> don't take my word over George Gershwin's necessarily. But uh, this chord progression here from D flat to E flat to F, flat six, flat seven, one, is sometimes referred to as the Mario chord progression because I'm told there was once a video game with a character named Mario in it that had a chord progression in its music. I've never played the game. I don't know anything about that music, um, and you're all laughing at me again. But uh, it's true. I mean, I, I know that I know it's called Super Mario Brothers, right? But sorry, I don't know the music. Um, but I do know that that is the chord progression that people say comes from that. So, um, so when you're the question comes up, well, why does any of this matter? Does it matter if you go to related keys or distant keys? Well, it matters because related keys are going to be subtle. 
there's only one note difference in the scale. Going from C to G, you might think, hey, that's a long ways away. It's a fifth away on the piano. Yeah, but it's only one note different in the scale. It's F natural versus F sharp. There's only one note different going from C to G or going from F to C, one flat from that's just a difference between B flat and B natural, right? So from F to C is a related key because it's only one step different, B flat or B natural. Going from F to A flat seems like it's closer on a piano, right? From F to C is that far. From F to A flat is only that far, but we had to change a lot to make that happen. F major just has B flat as our only black note. A flat has one, two, three, four black notes, right? So it grew three new black notes. It grew three notes that weren't there before. So the ear is going to perceive it as a, as a much bigger change, a much more dramatic key change. That is how the ear perceives key changes. It's by not how far apart they are on the piano. To some extent, that can matter for like range, like if a vocalist has to sing it a lot higher and it puts them in a higher range of their voice, you'll notice that. Or same with other instruments where you can tell the difference by how high they're playing. But overall, other than when it, when you hit the extremes of the range, the first thing that you're going to be hit with is how different, is how many changes, how many new notes there are. So having these distant relationships from F to A flat is more dramatic. And yeah, it just wasn't done in the Baroque or classical so much until you hit the Romantic era. Then those sort of, those drama, those bits of drama become what, you know, Schumann was all about, uh, dramatic key changes, not just Schumann, but lots of other people of that, of that era. So, um, so yeah, it's, it's, I think of that now as like, it's not even dramatic anymore. It's expected now. It's like, like you say, it's monotonous without it, right? It's, it starts to feel like, boy, if I don't put a dramatic key change in there, it's going to be boring. Now it's possible to not make it be boring, right? I mean, Mozart wrote a lot of music and it doesn't have dramatic key changes and people like it, right? Um, the, the guy caught on a little bit, but, um, and people still like uh, music that you know, can be a relatively long piece without really dramatic key changes. You can do other things to create drama. But the dramatic key change is an effective way to create drama for very little cost, right? You don't need more instruments. You don't need to do anything different. You've got the exact same kind of accompaniment happening here, the same, you know, the same patterns happening. And uh, as far as how, you know, what's going on, you, you're not like suddenly having someone play 16th note arpeggios, right? Because that's another way to create drama. So just changing kind of the tonality, the keys that are involved in a dramatic way while keeping the basic feel of a piece the same is a way to create one type of drama. So the idea when we talk about form, it's all about creating, you know, particular expectations uh, that have a certain type of familiarity. And if you want it to feel really simple, you stick with a, a, sing, a single key. If you want it to feel like there's a little bit of motion, you, you give them a related key change. If you want to feel like there's some drama, you give them unrelated keys. But then also the bigger question of, well, what about this whole form? Is it important to repeat that melody at the end? Well, not necessarily. It's common in the sonata form. It's common in a lot of forms to have a melody that's stated at the beginning, get repeated at the end, but it's not by any means universal. There's plenty of forms in music that don't restate that original theme. We have, excuse me, what are called binary themes, that it's just the A theme and the B theme. It's like the, the, the exposition of a sonata with the rest ripped out, just the A theme and the B theme, and then it's over. Maybe you repeat the A theme, and then maybe you repeat the B theme, but you don't go back from A from B to A. And if you think about things like the minuet in G, right? The ba da 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 that was attributed to Bach so long, but wasn't really his. After you don't hear that melody, it ends uh, after the the B theme on that piece. I don't think there's a DC on it. I know some of those pieces do have you a DC, but this thinking about the overall form it has a lot to do with managing expectations. We don't want randomness. We don't want a stream of consciousness. Oh, I heard that really cool thing and then I never hear it again. We get a lot of, of our enjoyment in listening to music from hearing something a second time and having 
that second time have some familiarity to it. That's why we have multiple, a pop song will have multiple verses, maybe different lyrics each time, but we'll keep reusing that melody. And then we'll actually have the chorus come again and again and again with the same melody and the same lyrics, right? That idea of repeating something, giving us something familiar, whether it's a head at the beginning, head out at the end, the exposition and recapitulation, um, or that pop song, verse, chorus, verse, chorus, verse, chorus. These, these are all different ways of managing our expectations of uh, repetition. And with that in mind, uh, I wanted to find, except except I lost it. Oh, it's in New Score. That's right. Um, the rondo that um, was posted here. Uh, and I have, sorry, I've forgotten uh, your name. Um, let's see. The rondo was from help me out. There we go. Parsa. Um, so uh, this is the rondo, right? I hope I have the right one. Let me just click the link and be sure. Rondo. Yeah. Okay. So a rondo is a type of form and I'm going to play some of this. Um, it's a form and I'm going to come back to this actually, cause it's really interesting, but I want to play some of it now. Um, it's a form in which we have an A theme. So there's a lot to unpack in that A theme. There's really a lot of sub-themes. So this, again, you could take under a microscope like like uh, Dean was with the Beethoven, and I would like other people to look at, but maybe look at it in terms of those big picture things also. So this, as an A theme, has got a lot going on. We have ba da 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 and then we have this da 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 right, stuff. And then it, it kind of goes back and forth between them, different variations. And then within each one, there's this counterpoint, right? I thought at first, my ear told me it was imitative counterpoint, but it isn't really. I mean, the second melody here, the first melody. And then, right, that's the same theme as the original, but in the same voice. So it's not imitative counterpoint in that it wasn't a new voice entered with that original theme. It's just the same voice repeating it, but there is counterpoint going on in that bassoon has something else happening. It's got moving quarter notes over this. So there's a lot of like counterpoint in here, but it's not in an imitative form. In any case, um, we have that is our kind of varied A theme, but then our B theme is pretty noticeably different different key, different tempo and everything, as well as a different texture, right? Right, it feels very different from our A theme. This is our B theme, which he has very conveniently labeled for us. Um, but then coming out of that, and I, I, I'm gonna go deeper into this again uh, in in a future one, but I, I wanna relate this to sonatas and uh, then re come back to sonatas. Now, Right, that is the A theme coming back. It's different though, it's very different. The original version was kind of a minor key. Right, it's, it's pretty minor key sounding with those pitch levels, but when it comes back here, it's got much more of a major key feel. And then it goes somewhere a little different. So he's reusing a material, but it's not just a copy and paste job. But then after that secondary A theme plays its, uh, has its run, then we're gonna get yet another theme.
right? So there's that theme. And by the way, I'm looking at the chat. And yes, Joanne, I, I definitely want to come back. Now that I've finally got a hold of your, your piece, I'm going to listen to it all the way through and be able to talk about that in more depth uh, next time as well. But I didn't want to didn't want to say too much about it cold. I just wanted to be able to relate to what I was talking about then. And then I'll, I'll look at it more uh, over the upcoming days. Um, uh, so anyhow, we have the C theme now, right? Which is something different. But then the C theme runs its course, and what we get next is A again. With different stuff in it. That da 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 had showed up earlier uh, in a part that I hadn't uh, showed you before, but it's like material that was borrowed from that C theme. So the form of this was A, B, A, and then C, and then back to A. That type of theme, that kind of form where there's basically one main theme that alternates with other things, A, B, A, C, A, D, A, E, A, F. You can have as many other themes as you want, but coming back to the A theme, after every one of them, that is called a rondo. And that is also a really common uh, sort of theme for larger scale works because you write a limited amount of material and you it basically becomes twice as long as, you know, you write 30 bars of material, but you get a 60 page piece out of it because, uh, or 30, whatever, 30 bars, you get 60 bars because you keep coming back to that A theme over and over and over again. And I'm not saying you do it to have the length. No, you, you do it to create a longer piece that has familiarity, that doesn't feel like a, a 30 minute run on sentence, but feels like, oh, we got to keep hearing familiar uh, music throughout the whole thing. So Rondo form is in fact, perhaps in the classical era, I, again, Mr. Firefox, maybe you could help me out with some specifics. I'm gonna guess that it's probably the second most common form after sonata form as far as big, arrangements of things, right? I mean, you could, if you're writing a one page piece, no, then it's like there's much simpler forms than that. But if we're talking about larger scale pieces, um, things that are like sonata move, a whole movement of a symphony. Sonata form is typically used for the first movement of a uh, symphony or sonata. And then often again for the last movement. And then the interior movements will be something else. And Rondo is one of them that it might be. It might uh, have like the Beethoven Pathetique Sonata really has Rondo form for both the second and the third movements are both Rondo forms. Uh, the other, well, the most famous uh, Beethoven Symphony, the Moonlight Sonata does not use Sonata form for the first movement. It's, it's well, does it? No. It's, it's its own thing, right? Because it's the slow movement first. I haven't really thought too much about the overall structure of the thing. So uh, I won't I won't uh, comment further on that until I have a chance to think about it more. So, um, so uh, uh, yeah, and, yeah, and again, I definitely want to talk about your piece, Joanne, because yeah, unfortunately, as of the last time I had a chance to check, I, I hadn't uh, seen that the link actually worked. So, uh, so I didn't come prepared to be able to talk about it. But anyhow, I've been talking about form and sonata form in particular. Well, the sonata form, uh, I'm going to assume, I shouldn't assume, I should actually look at uh, Dean's analysis of the Beethoven and to see if when it finishes the uh, um, the new theme there, the B theme. What I'm calling the B theme, meaning the secondary theme, is actually letter E in his analysis because he's he's mostly anal analyzing at a, at a smaller level than that, which is useful also. But if we take the big picture, A, th a through D was the A section. E through... Uh, whatever is going on here. So he doesn't even have this marked at 125. So Dean, I would say this is like, even though this is a return to the original melody, um, this is the start, what measure 125 is the start of the development section. And we know that because we hit the, we hit the repeat at the end of the exposition. So this is the start of the start of the development. And it's, you know, reusing stuff in the A section, but different harmonies and so forth. Oh, here's where you've got it, red letter H. I don't, I don't know, it's in here. So this is the start of the development section at letter H. Um, 
And then he's talking about the little use of melodies. And the melodies, though, even when we listen. Da -da -da -dum, he's got this identified as a different melody, but it's, again, related, right? Da -da -da -dum, it's that three eighth notes, and it's an ascending pattern. So it's related to the one we had. Ba -da -da -dum, or ba -da -da -dum, ba -da -da -dum, ba da da dum ba da 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 dum right? It's related to that, except instead of having a repeated pitch, it's three separate pitches, but it's clearly relating to that idea. It's the ascending version of a theme uh, of, of a motif that I think he had labeled as C, maybe. I forget which lab which motif is which here, but um, uh, it's, it's the ascending form of one of these. Well, whatever, it doesn't really matter. Um, but uh, it's that three three note, ba da da dum dash, dot, 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 dash, <laughs> to use the Morse code version of things. So sorry, I'm giving people a headache by scrolling here so much. Um, but the development section on this piece goes on for a while, quite a while longer than um, uh, the Mozart piece, because it's a bigger piece, right? And uh, there's all this stuff going on here. That ba -da 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 -da, that's what actually, that was the horn heralding the start of the B theme. But now he's playing with that, ba -da 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 -da, like that's a theme in itself and playing with that. And then these back and forth chords, hey, let's play with that. Right? And now it's, let's shorten that in one chord back and forth. And now let's repeat that chord and get quieter and move it to things. What's coming next? Oh, you see it coming, right? And then he's coming back to that. So he's, he's just having a ball playing with these themes through here. False recapitulation. Okay, so yeah, there's a place where it looks like maybe you think it's going to be the recapitulation, but uh, Dean is saying, nope, it's false because it does something different. And I guess we'll find out. So, um, I mean, it sure feels like the, the recapitulation is there, but of course I'm not like, I haven't gone through the whole thing. Um, so, uh, but it looks like here's the, the horn, except this time it's a bassoon. And so he has it uh, orchestrated differently. Oh, that was timpani going bum, 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 instead of cellos. That's a nice little touch there too. Um, And in any case, it goes through the whole thing, and then it, it uh, at some point uh, ends. And he has what's called a coda here, where he's basically really throwing us more, throwing us more of that ba da 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 stuff, more so. Like you may remember at the end of the actual exposition, he did bring back some ba 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 bump, but it was only that much. This stuff is all new stuff. And more stuff, right? So he's got all this stuff. It's called a coda that he puts he puts on the end of it. So um, so maybe that's what you're getting at with a false uh, uh, recapitulation, and that maybe you're saying that somewhere the code what what I'm calling a coda is. Yeah, I, to me this is all coda here, um, and then it finally comes to its conclusion here um, with. So this version here feels like a yet another quieter version of like he's giving us yet another version of a of a uh, of recapitulation, but it's just a it's just a little quiet down and then a final dramatic thing. So in Beethoven's case, he's using that sonata form, but he's really expanding, making a really long development. And then his recapitulation involves that whole coda, it's called, when you have all these extra measures at the end where you keep playing with. It's like a secondary development, really. So 
What I would say is, well, that's a big sonata form piece. It's big. It's long. It was like, what did I say? 500 measures is what it ended up being by the end. I guess 200. And I think that's because in my head, I was thinking 4-4. Four, four, and I was just sort of, no, I wasn't really doing math on this. But if it had been 4-4, four, 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 it would have been 250 measures. But in 2-4, it's actually 500 measures. So, um, but the, the Mozart uh, sonata there that we looked at is much, much shorter than that. Um, it's much shorter. It's the whole thing is 70 something measures, right? You could write a full sonata form and just have an eight measure A section, an eight measure B section. So your entire, uh, your entire exposition is 16 bars and, uh, and then 16 more for the recapitulation is 32. And uh, you could have the whole, yeah, you could totally have the whole thing done in, uh, um, you know, less than 70 bars if you want to have it done in 50 bars. Um, so you could totally write yourself a short um, sonata form, you know, just one movement of a sonata. By all means, write other movements if you want. But I would put, I would put it out there. If you've never written a sonata, like I, I told you, I haven't. I'm going to. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to compose one. I'm going to make it real simple, real kind of by the book. But I'm just kind of interested to play with that as a form because I've done so much of this jazz version of the same form. Um, uh, that, but I've never like written that sort of thing out with the whole business with the key related keys and all. So that's my challenge to you is to write yourself a sonata movement in sonata form. Now that you've seen me talk about all these things and, uh, I don't know, hopefully we'll get to see some of your submissions in coming weeks. Uh, but yeah, I'm also going to want to take another look at that Rondo of Parsos and I want to look at Joanne's piece and, you know, other things that get submitted, but you know, we've got some people I've been, uh, who have been submitting a lot of stuff and I've been able to look at a lot of their music. I'm looking forward to seeing some more music from some new people as well. So, uh, let's, uh, let's get ready to come out here. I hope you've all had a, a good time this week going over some music and learning a little bit about form and not just what it is, but why it's that way and how some of the parts fit together and what it really does for you. You know, what what these things do and why key changes we try to do the way we do and uh, all, you know, why it's good to be able to come back to a familiar melody and the different ways of doing it. So hope that allows you to start constructing some uh, some larger pieces of your own built from small amounts of material. So I will hopefully be able to uh, see you next week. Don't really know what's uh, in store for me family-wise, but at this point, I'm not anticipating any changes. So hopefully I will see you all next week. Uh, goodbye. <laughs>